he was on this this talk show, and the guy asked Dan what I thought was a rather uh, insulting question, and it was something to the effect of, uh, "What do you say about the statement that Nashville and the country music scene is where pop stars go when they fail in their careers?" Tony Gottlieb, longtime manager of today's subject, Dan Seals. I think it was always very unfair, uh, certainly in Dan's early career, that because he had had his initial success, you know, in the rock and roll adult contemporary music scene, that when Dan showed up in Nashville, he was considered a pop act. All right. I could say this with confidence. Listeners who are around in the 70s, without question, are familiar with the work of soft rock duo England Dan and John Ford Coley. I'm not talking about the video, and I don't want to change your life. And no doubt, country music fans who tuned in in the 80s could not have missed the string of hits by the singer Dan Seals. Both acts that I just mentioned reached the top levels of success in their respective genres. But I'd venture a bet that most of this audience did not know that England Dan and Dan Seals were really the same person. Even if you did know that, you may well be subject to one of the many common misconceptions around Danny. You might have thought, as many have, that Dan Seals was the Seals from Seals and Crofts. Nope. That was his older brother, Jim. Maybe you thought the singer once called England Dan was British. Or you may have confused him with one of the many other Sealses, cousins of his mainly, in country music. Best yet, you might have thought he was one of the Osmonds. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Seals and Marie Osmond. Or you may think he was a country music imposter because of his previous career in pop music, and because of his occasional crossover appeal during his country career. Of all the misconceptions around Danny, that one's the most damaging. And the one I'd most like to correct here today. So here, finally, today on the Neon Neighbors podcast, we've got a quarter century of chart success in multiple genres to cover. It's the tale of England Dan Seals. Let's clear one thing up right off the bat. Danny Wayland Seals was pure country from the get-go. He was born in McCamey, Texas, a small oil boom town on the southern edge of the mighty Llano Estacado, and he was Texan through and through. In fact, many elements of his upbringing there, the setting and the characters and the stories, would inspire his later songwriting. His father, Wayland Seals, was a hard-working pipeliner for Shell. He was pipeline gang. When they'd get a leak, he'd go dig them up. That's Danny Seals himself. Daddy Wayland would also moonlight as a rockabilly singer and guitar player. Listen, everybody, while I play the news, a new song playing on the old past blue. Hold me on mine, if you're a past blue. That's Jimmy and Danny Seals' father, Wayland, in the 50s. The Oil Patch Blues. Now, to say the Seals family was a musical family would be a colossal understatement. There was something in the gene pool. Beyond just Wayland and his sons, there was Chuck Seals, a cousin, known for co-writing the Ray Price standard, Crazy Arms. Crazy arms that reach to hold somebody new. And another cousin, Troy Seals, a hit songwriter in the 80s and 90s. Johnny Duncan, who scored a lot of popular hits with Janie Fricky, was kin. As was Brady Seals, founding member of the band Little Texas. God bless Texas. That's funny, because it seems like after all these years, I'm still meeting Seals. Manager Tony Gottlieb. And then, of course, Dan had a half-brother, an older brother than Jim, whose name was Eddie Seals. And Eddie was a 
professional musician, landed in Nashville, had a duo named Joe and Eddie. And then there was Danny and his older brother, Jimmy Seals. Their father kept a little family band going when both the boys were very young. I joined the family band when I was four, playing a stand-up bass on Naffle Crate. My brother, Jimmy, he was the Texas State champion fiddler at nine. Dan, of course, was, uh, I think, about five years younger than Jimmy and sort of idolized his brother growing up because Jimmy was a talented hoedown fiddler. How about now the uh, fiddle virtuoso, Mr. James Seals, ready to perform one of his great works. What's it going to be? <clears throat> well, uh, this is called the 8th of January. Bob Collins. Jimmy would take off from Texas to become a professional musician in his teens. And after a small stint in the band The Champs, best known for the song Tequila, he and fellow Champs band member Dash Crofts would eventually create, of course, Seals and Crofts. Summer breeze makes me feel fine Going through the jazz gun in my mind Jimmy Seals is your brother, is that? Did he teach you anything along the way? Well, we used to have a family group together many years ago, and uh, we get to play together every once in a while. What kind of music did you play at home? We played country and western music. Hillbilly music, that's what they used to call it, hillbilly. Now it became country and western, then it became country. For his part, Danny would also learn a variety of instruments growing up. He learned how to play guitar, interestingly, upside down picking a normally strung right-handed guitar with his left hand. He was also dangerous on the saxophone, and, of course, he could sing. Like his older brother Jim, Danny would also eventually leave West Texas in his adolescence. Jimmy, of course, went out on the road. Dan's uh, mother and father divorced when Dan was relatively young, and Dan was moved away to Dallas. A pivotal move for the young Danny Seals. It was in Dallas where Danny was first exposed to other varieties of popular music, like soul. Roy Orbison, uh, Sam Cooke, and Jackie Wilson. I was really into black music for a while. And that was where, he, of course, he met uh, his longtime partner, John Coley. And they, uh, for a while, had a band called the Southwest FOB, Freight on Board. So meet them with their new hit song called Smell of Incense. Say hello to Southwest FOB. They were, they were sort of, you know, chasing the psychedelic rock scene. They had a song called The Smell of Incense. And locked the door. Her eyes grew large and asking. And the smell of we really only had one genuine half hit, yeah. is what we call it. it. It got in the 40s, Billboard, in the, the rock music, and top, uh, pop music, all that, you know, that scene. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Dan Seals' first national exposure was on a psychedelic rock song. 1968's Smell of Incense by the Southwest FOB. It peaked at number 58 on the Billboard Top 100. But, as it happens, the success was short-lived, and Dan and John Coley would eventually leave to do their own thing. Sort of in the footsteps of Dan's brother and Dash Crofts, decided to form a, you know, a folk-oriented duo. You, in 1969, you quit FOB in England, Dan is born? 1970? Well, actually, Waylon and Sean was born, and Dan and John was born, and we kept screwing around trying to find us a name, <laughs> and finally we went out to Los Angeles. And I told my brother, I said, I don't know what we're going to call ourselves because your group is yeah. already pretty famous. And I said, we can't use Seals and Coley. What should we do? I've encountered a few different versions of just what happened next. Of course, we know how it all ends. Somehow, Dan Seals lands on the name England Dan, and the duo becomes England Dan and John Ford Coley. But why England for the undoubtedly Texan Dan Seals? Well, Danny and Tony both seem to agree on what really took place. People often wonder what the impetus was for that. 
it was actually his older brother, Jim, who came up with the name England Dan. He looked right at me and he says, you've always been a dime store cowboy. <laughs> Dan, you're really not a cowboy. <laughs> he says, you don't like horses. You dress up in them top hats and canes and stuff like that, and you'd carry a derringer. And he says, you sound like an England Dan. That was how it came about. But there's another popular version of that story. I've heard it on country music radio and seen it on the internet in various places and even heard it out of the mouth of Mike Huckabee. John Ford Coley met his music partner Dan Seals in Texas. Dan's nickname was England Dan due to his fake British accent while pretending to be the fifth Beatle. He should have known better. Everybody knows I was going to be the fifth Beatle, of course. In this version, it's claimed that Danny, as a young kid, was a big fan of the Beatles and would go around affecting a British accent. As such, the family would call him England Dan growing up. No, I don't know where that came from. I, I don't think I ever heard him do uh, any imitations unless they were Johnny Cash. <laughs> you know, Dan was a West Texas boy, born, bred, you you know, as worldly and as, as eclectic and as broad-minded as Dan Seals was, he was a West Texas boy, and it was never coming out of it. <laughs> May the record stand forever corrected. And so, in the early 70s, newly christened duo England Dan and John Ford Coley moved off to L.A. in the footsteps of Jimmy Seals and Dash Crofts. And they landed a deal with AM Records. Step on, why do you cry? Don't you know your tears will dry? Take well, we hit in Japan. We, uh, a yes, song called did. Simone from the second album was a, mm -hmm. a number one in it, over there. And so we went and played the Budokan and uh, Nagoya and Kyoto, Osaka. And then we came back home and couldn't get a job anymore, and it was really a mind wow, thing. Man. It's like, here's thousands of people yeah. watching you, and now here's nobody or maybe mm -hmm. ten people at a club watching you. And so we realized that uh, the business can begin and be mm -hmm. over in a matter of three weeks. Isn't that something else? <laughs> After suboptimally performing with the first two records, A&M released the duo in 1972, and thus began a four-year dry spell for Danny and John. Because uh, Jimmy and Dash um, were doing so well during those years, it always gave them sort of a platform to work. They could go open for Seals and Crofts on big shows. Uh, this big, tall, handsome, good-looking uh, milk drinker here is my younger brother, Dan Seals. I don't claim kin to this one, though. I don't blame you. That's beautiful. So they weren't, you know, destitute. They just didn't have a real name at that point. Uh, but I think those were pretty tough days for those guys. But after a few years in limbo, their fortune would change. First, they switched managers. Then we started being managed instead of being managed by Marsha Day, which was Seals and Cross manager. We started managed by Susan Joseph, one of her secretaries. And she left the Day organization and we left them. Two other characters would enter the story right about now. The first is someone that you may be familiar with. Well, Kyle Lenning is one of my dearest and oldest friends. Uh, he, I actually knew Kyle Lenning before he knew Dan and John. Check out the first Neon Neighbors episode on Randy Travis for more on Kyle Lenning. Much like the Randy Travis catalog, Dan Seals' catalog was mainly produced by Kyle Lenning both in the England Dan era and after. But at this time, Kyle Lenning was just an engineer for an independent recording studio. In the evenings or late at night, uh, Kyle would record demos and produce on spec different artist situations. And one of those uh, songwriters was a young uh, guy named Parker McGee. The other important character. Parker McGee was an inspired songwriter who was notably signed to Dawnbreaker Music. Dawnbreaker being the publishing company founded around the Seals and Crofts catalog, wouldn't you know? And Parker had a little tune to shop around. Parker's uh, relationship with Dawnbreaker produced a project that was 
Dan and John singing the original I'd Really Love to See You Tonight. They sent the song around to a bunch of artists in L.A. and no one would cut Really Love to See You Tonight. And we said, give us 30 days with it. And on spec, uh, Dan and John showed up in Hendersonville, Tennessee, and in a little basement studio on the you know, far side of Old Hickory Lake, Lee Hazen's recording studio, uh, Kyle produced this record, I'd Really Love to See It in a Of course, Dan and John were now four years removed from their release from A&M Records. With I'd Really Love to See You Tonight in the can, manager Susan Joseph scrambled to find the duo a record deal. As the story goes, uh, at the time, Susan Joseph was playing it uh, for the Atlantic president there on the West Coast when a young record guy at the time uh, in the next office, uh, Doug Morris, who later became the big, you know, titan of the record business, uh, overheard the song being played. And though Jerry Greenberg turned it down, Doug decided he wanted that record for his burgeoning label, Big Tree Records. Doug Morris came in there and said, I got to have that record. I got to have the group. Who is it? And so he told us, we might be a little label with six people working for it, but I know a song and we can take it to the top. If you give us a chance. And so the duo inked a single deal with Big Tree Records, best known at that time for the artist Lobo. I'd really love to see you tonight shot up to number two on Billboard in 1976. I'd really love to see you tonight became a uh, pop record and sold, you know, in record time about oh, close to two million singles. So they were fast rising stars at that point. <laughs> It turned England Dan and John Ford Coley from a an acoustic duo who had opened shows for you know half the people in the business to doing our own show in a matter of months. The monster success of I'd Really Love to See You Tonight led to the first full album for Big Tree Records, Nights Are Forever, named after the Parker McGee tune and next single by the duo, Nights Are Forever Without You. Waiting and wondering about you. That single followed Really Love to See You Tonight to the Top 10. And for your next music trivia night, while Nights Are Forever was in the Top 10, so too was the Seals and Crofts song, Get Closer. Darling, if you want me to be closer to you, get closer to me. Making this one of the rare times in music history when siblings in different acts had simultaneous Top 10s. All told, the Nights Are Forever album was hugely important to Dan Seals' career, not just because it was his first sustained success in the music industry, but also because it got him hooked up with Kyle Lenning and it got him making music in Nashville, Tennessee. The rest of the England Dan and John Ford Coley catalog would be recorded in Nashville and produced by Kyle Lenning. I fell in love with the place and... Uh i got to tell you a story. One of the reasons I, I decided to come back to country music is I was watching the, the Grand Ole Opry one night while John and I were recording, and they were doing one of my songs from the previous album. Jim and Jesse were doing Showboat Gambler, and they recorded it as a single. Mm. Showboat Gambler was an album cut on the Nights Are Forever record, written by just Danny by himself, and it had a real country flavor to it. I'm a That's older brother Jimmy Seals on fiddle. As Danny mentioned, it was a pretty big deal for him when he heard superstar bluegrass group J.D. Crow and the New South covering this tune. I'm a regular, gambler. I make my living on the run. I'm a regular, gambler. 
So Danny was already flirting with country music as early as 1976, when he was breaking as a soft rock act. The duo kept at it through the rest of the 70s. And while they'd never repeat the success of I'd Really Love to See You Tonight, a few more England Dan and John Ford Coley singles would top the adult contemporary charts. In 1977, It's Sad to Belong. That it's sad to belong to someone else when the right one comes along. We'll Never Have to Say Goodbye Again in 78. And perhaps most memorably, the Todd Rundgren cover, Love is the Answer. Light of the world, shine on me, love is the answer. Shine on us all, shine us me, love is the answer. Come on, my country music fans, don't act like you can't appreciate those late 70s soft rock tones. But the party wouldn't last beyond the 70s anyway. We decided to call it completely in December of 79. Big Tree sold to Atlantic in January of 1980. And Doug Morris got rid of the company and then they made him head of Atlantic. So that was happening as we were breaking up. Dan and John had been together since they were in high school. And Inevitably, I think it's, it's not uncommon that when great success is achieved and people who have spent many, many years together, the stresses and strains um, bring out issues that maybe weren't addressed previously. And I think they just got to a point where they felt like they had to, to move on in their own direction. And... Of course, that wasn't very popular with record companies in those days. You know, they wound up having to sort of separately fulfill the their recording agreements uh, that they had made, uh, and that didn't that that didn't bode well. Danny was still on the hook for two Atlantic releases post breakup. His first such effort was called Stones, credited to one England Dan Seals in 1980. Stones. You got a woman, you want to please her, and you got a woman. He followed Stones up with Harbinger in 1982, this time permanently dropping the England from his name. We are the day springs and we all fill the pool. Here's the man on the north face, Harbinger, sage our fool. Recorded predominantly to fulfill his contract to Atlantic Records, Stones and Harbinger represent some of Danny's lesser-known material. The Stones LP was a dismal seller. Uh, it was a time when I was trying to make up my mind what I was going to do. Follow. It was a, a follow-up and a continuing of the England and John Ford mm-hmm. Coley contract. Moore had been occupying Danny Seals' mind in the wake of the England, Dan, and John Ford Coley split in the early 80s. But it was also the beginning when they separated of an incredibly difficult time for both of them, uh, which lasted for quite some years. Uh, It was a financially disastrous scenario. At that time I was bankrupt, separated, and uh, living under this piano here and at friends' places, my kids were at friends' houses, and you know, it was a real bad time. When I quit England, Dan John Ford Coley, there were a lot of expenses and stuff I had no aware of, or was not aware of, and business moves, management moves, and but mine was the only name on the label, <laughs> so uh, I inherited hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of lawsuits and stuff that I wasn't aware of. And, I dealt with it for about a year and a half, two years. 
the IRS and all these kind of things. I never paid our taxes. The business manager didn't do. They came and got my house. And I was here in Hendersonville one day, and they came and got my my Volkswagen van. Finally, they just came in one day and said, "Well, all right, it's over." And so it was over. I took everything but that old fifty, no sixty-seven Carmen Ghia. I've got. I still got it. What uh, kept you going during that period? I, you know, when you get in a situation like that, you don't have anywhere to go but up. <laughs> you know, it's going to get better sometime. You just don't know how. Of course, he was right. A few orders of business, though, before things would start to get better. First, he adopted today's interviewee, Tony Gottlieb, as his manager. And that was when I moved to Nashville and uh, Kyle Lenning and I formed a business together. Tony first had ambitions of being on the music publishing and production side of the industry. Before too long, though, a soft rock singer from the Kyle Lenning ethos started getting in his ear. And he, he thought it would be a good idea if I were to become his manager. After some initial reluctance, Tony eventually acquiesced. And so Dan's management sort of took me in a direction that lasted about 30 years. It lasted, you know, to this very day. It was a pivotal move for getting Danny back on his feet. Just as was, incidentally, a style change. Danny was working on his third solo album, his follow-up to Harbinger. He was working with me and Kyle, and we decided to bring in Michael Clark, the songwriter, to help us produce it. Remembering the day that I left you I thought it'd be easy to And I just, I didn't feel it anymore. I quit. I told him one day, I said, you know, I can't go out on stage and play this. So producer Kyle Lenning astutely told Danny to take a break and think about just how he wanted to proceed. Feeling a rekindled passion for the country music of his early childhood, Danny came back a few weeks later with his answer. So I came back in two or three weeks. I said, I've written a couple of songs, and here's a couple from friends. I mm -hmm. want to do a country album because yeah. that's where my heart's at. And so we did a, uh, a little spec deal uh, with some of the musicians that had been hired uh, in the earlier years to do the England Dan John Ford Coley stuff. And Kyle produced a four-single uh, session, uh, uh, which eventually we signed at Liberty Records. Which eventually morphed into Danny's first country album, 1983's magnificent Rebel Heart. Rebel hearts will break away. Forbidden love will find a way. Found a freedom in the night. Of course, the first song, uh, Everybody's Dream Girl, did pretty well. In fact, for his first country single, it did quite respectably. Just like that, Danny found himself with a top 20 country hit with 1983's Everybody's Dream Girl. She's everybody's dream girl. I'm gonna make her mine. Everybody's dream girl. I'll see you in my dreams tonight. Just a sidebar. This one's one of my favorites, and there's no chance that Danny and Kyle and them weren't listening to the Eagles' old 55 before cutting that song. Okay, sidebar over. And then I think we put out a song called After You. After You. Love will never be the Fairly tepid. It was a nice song. but uh, And then I think we put a song out called You Really Go For The Heart that was a little brighter tune. You really go for the heart. I couldn't help but love you, babe. You take the feeling all the way. That's the way you are. But we just weren't nailing it. And, you know, I was working gigs with him. And people liked the song God Must Be a Cowboy at Heart. The most country song on the record. And the one about which everybody involved was the most sheepish, at least at first. See, with Rebel Heart, Danny really found his stride as a songwriter. He was working alongside other songwriters he admired, like Rafe Van Hoy and Van Stevenson, and really got into a good groove. 
Listen, for example, to the story songs on Rebel Heart, like Up on the Hill or The Banker, the latter clearly inspired by his early childhood in the oil fields of West Texas. You see, I'm going to sink a well. I'll dig right down to hell if I have to. Danny was getting really good at writing a compelling, character-driven story song, which really would become something of a signature for him. And there was a lot of good writing to be proud of on Rebel Heart. But that song Tony mentioned, God Must Be a Cowboy, that one wasn't necessarily the best showcase of his writing. Good a song as it was, it was more of a novelty song. But that was the song that live audiences would respond to. And so they insisted that it become the fourth single from Rebel Heart. I distinctly remember being at the A&R meeting uh, at Liberty Records and the great Lynn Schultz and Paul Lovelace, uh, who were running that show in those days, uh, were sitting in the room. And, of course, we made it known that we wanted to put out God Must Be a Cowboy at Heart and watching the body language of those two guys who are just like, oh no, this is, this is the end. <laughs> but my, my, oh my, uh, that one had legs. It had a life of its own. And I think God must be a cowboy at heart. He Released in January of 1984. God Must Be a Cowboy reached number 10 on the country charts and broke Dan Seals wide open to the mainstream country audience. And uh, it surprised everybody. It really did surprise everybody how, how they took to it. And that was really the start of Dan's country music career, I have to say. It was God Must Be a Cowboy. Suddenly they wanted to hear hear us all over the country. They wanted us to come to Texas and Oklahoma and Montana and all kinds of places. With the release of Rebel Heart, new country act Dan Seals found himself in need of a road band. Remember, Rebel Heart was cut with session musicians, many of whom played on the England Dan and John Ford Coley records. For his live show, Dan needed some competent pickers who were flexible enough to tour with him. There was a fully formed band that was was basically a duo, Gary Jones and, and Joe Stanley, both both who have passed on since. They, actually, they're a self-contained band out of Paducah, Kentucky, and they've had uh, a song in the charts, and uh, they, they're hometown boys in Carbondale, Illinois, and Paducah. They had come into our world to start making records, and at that time, Dan really needed a band, and they were looking for some opportunities and so it was decided the gary jones and joe stanley band out of the paducah kentucky area would back dan seals on the road on the bar stool thrown with the country song we'll see the vision of purity light and everybody loves the queen of saturday night mm-hmm. when we played Nightclubs, they used to open the show, and then Dan would come in for the, for the main portion. And Gary and Joe were very talented guys. Gary was a kind of very uh, capable front man. Joe really became sort of the artistic center for the band and for a lot of the sound that Dan adopted thereafter. Dan and his band kept up a hectic touring schedule in the 80s oftentimes headlining the bill at small and medium-sized clubs within days of opening for bigger acts. And, given Danny's recent financial troubles, Tony Gottlieb had them on a very tight budget. We travel in a van. We don't have a big bus. Don't plan on getting one. We haven't took a dime from anybody. There's no loans made. We don't owe anybody anything. We've had to keep the expenses down because... It hasn't been so long ago that I didn't have anything. And we're, we, if we can't buy it for cash now, it just don't get bought. Anything costs money, it's like, boy, it's hard getting a nickel out of Tony Gottlieb, I'll tell you. Yeah. Going to do one that started the career off back in 1976. We'll see if you remember this one. Yeah. 
I'm not talking about moving in And I don't want to change your life But there's a warm wind blowing the stars around It would be love to see you tonight Did fans know that Dan Seals, the country guy, was actually England Dan from the 70s? Um, you know, it's an interesting question. By and large, they did not. He was really starting over again. I don't even think Liberty Records at the time they signed Dan actually knew he was England Dan. I think they thought he was Jim. So they were just, you know, they had heard these the songs that Kyle had produced, this four song spec deal, and uh, they liked it and they thought they were getting Jim Seals from Seals and Crofts. Now with a top 10 country hit under his belt and a bunch of touring behind him, Dan Seals went back into the studio to record his follow-up album, 1984's San Antonio. When you bring out the wild First single, You Bring Out the Wild Side of Me, hit number nine on the country charts. Third single and fan favorite, My Old Yellow Car, also would hit number nine. And if engines could run on desires alone, that old yellow car would be driving me home. The single in between those two, My Baby's Got Good Timing, is noteworthy for two reasons. The first is that it was his first number two country single. My baby's got good timing. Don't know how much she reads my mind. The other noteworthy thing about My Baby's Got Good Timing is that it marks his first songwriting collaboration with Bob McDill. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Bob McDill. He's not writing songs anymore, but... You know, Bob McDill was a, you know, a great literary genius in many ways, a hardworking one. Uh, you know, he read assiduously, you know, lots of literature that would support his songwriting. He's described it. Country music fans will surely know the work of Bob McDill. He co-wrote the Johnny Russell classics Catfish John and Rednecks, White Socks and Blue Ribbon Beer. He wrote many of the classics by the gentle giant, Don Williams, including the song Amanda, which Waylon Jennings also made a hit out of. He wrote a few of the Mel McDaniel hits over the years, like Baby's Got Her Blue Jeans On and Louisiana Saturday Night. He had hits all the way into the 90s for Alan Jackson and Sammy Kershaw. Over three decades, Bob McDill wasn't just writing songs. He was writing mega hits, including several with and for our own England Dan. Dan loved writing songs with Bob McDill. I mean, they had probably six or eight of of Dan's greatest songs were written as co-writes with Bob McDill. And, you know, Dan would always laugh and make a joke and say, I think it's time I called Bob McDill up and, Ask him what he's done for my career lately. And they were, you know, of course, fly fishing buddies and became great friends. And it all started with that second single off San Antone, My Baby's Got Good Timing. And with that, amazingly, by 1985, Dan Seals found himself consistently hitting the top ten. And boy, was there more to come. Well, uh, right now I'm really excited, Charlie. I have a, a duet with, uh, you remember England Dan, John Fort Coley? Yes. Well, Dan Seals is uh, recording country music now. We've just done a duet together called Meet Me in Montana. And I just found out this morning that it's uh, next week in Billboard. It'll be number five with a bullet. Number five with a bullet. Chart. So I'm uh, really excited about that. While Danny's third single from San Antone, My Old Yellow Car, was riding up the charts, Danny's record label, Liberty, had been absorbed into its parent company, Capitol Records. And executives Jim Fogelsong and Lynn Schultz were scheming. They wanted to sign Marie Osmond, 
And the best thing that they could do was a duet. And they found this Paul Davis song, Meet Me in Montana. And within 24 hours, we were in the recording studio. Paul Worley and Kyle co-produced it. And it, it, it all happened so fast, it would make your head spin. Darling, back home in your arms is right where The Marie Osmond duet, Meet Me in Montana, shot straight up to number one. Danny's first in an epic string of number ones that would carry out through the rest of the 80s. The tune was played all over country music radio, still is, and it earned the pair a CMA award. In fact, given the song's success and Marie Osmond's star power, Dan and Marie would become something of a fixture at the award shows during that time. Ladies and gentlemen, here to perform Meet Me in Montana are Dan Seals and Marie Osmond. Marie Osmond and Dan Seals. Marie Osmond and Dan Seals. Dan Seals and Marie Osmond. As Tony mentioned, Montana was written by a guy named Paul Davis. Yep, for those who are familiar, that Paul Davis. He, too, is a writer and performer in his own right, capable of crafting hits. So after the monumental success of Meet Me in Montana, Lynn Schultz at Capitol Records thought it would be a good idea for Dan Seals to dip back into Mr. Davis's catalog. I remember being downtown at, at uh, Capitol and Lynn Schultz grabbing me and taking me in the office and said, what do you think about Dan doing this song of Paul's? And of course... Sounded like a great idea to me. A great idea indeed. Because the song Lynn Schultz had his finger on would become the biggest hit of Danny's entire career. 1985's Bop. If Meet Me in Montana's impact was stratospheric, then Bop's impact was transcendent. The danceable Paul Davis and Jennifer Kimball co-write became something of a phenomenon. Not only did it hit number one on the country charts, but it also crossed over, hitting number 42 on the Billboard Top 100 and number 10 on the Adult Contemporary charts. His first entry into either chart since he was better known as England Dan. What changes have come about since Bob uh, crossed over to some extent? Uh, I'm getting mobbed a lot, uh, a lot more autographs. A lot more younger people are coming to the shows. I'm, when I say young, I'm talking like 16 to 18-year-old kids. Uh, the jobs, uh, the booking price has gone up and everybody wants us. Despite the mammoth success that Bop was for Dan, in interviews after the fact, Dan always seemed to distance himself from the song stylistically. To tell you the truth, it's not really representative of, of mostly what I do. It's like a five percent of what I do, and the the other the rest of the album is more of what we do. Rather than if we put Bop cut one side one, they're going to think that's Dan, and it's not. Let's be real. A purist would be hard pressed to call Bop a country song. Circling back to the top of the show, Bop remains one reason why some folks wrongly have questioned Danny's authenticity. Really and truly, though, to Capitol Records executive Lynn Schultz and manager Tony Gottlieb, Bob was just another opportunity to keep the ball rolling. You know, I, I think it was one of those situations where we, we, were, <laughs> we were needing stuff so much in those days, and any standout idea was a possibility. For his part, Tony Gottlieb is still very high on the song in retrospect. This song had been made on one of the early digital synthesizers, and Paul Davis had bought one. It was called a synclavier. So here I'm adjusting the octave ratio to 1.6, and the pre recorded sequence comes on now, sounding retuned. That whole texture behind it was all a sin club here. Uh, 
I remember that all that equipment showing up at the, the studio and it was so much we couldn't even fit it. And in those days, random access memory, this you'll probably appreciate this. Uh, they ran out of RAM in the Synclave here. And so they had to order two more megabytes, okay? Not gigabytes, megabytes. Two, $5,000 each. Ten grand well spent, Tony. After Bop, we didn't have another Bop. It was mm -hmm. the only up-tempo song like that, mm -hmm. and we've never tried to follow it up or anything. To try to follow up something with something that sounds just like it is a real cheap shot, I think. I, I don't believe in that. So you, you show them what you're made of, and Bop is about 15% of what I'm made of. <laughs> ballads are a little more. We figured, well, if we put a ballad out, this is really a good song. If, if they like this like we like it, then we may, may have a career happening here. Here's the part where I urge you. If you haven't heard Everything That Glitters Is Not Gold, the next single by Dan Seals, go ahead and pause this and give that a listen. You know, it came from a true story uh, from Dan's childhood, you know, where the, uh, the woman had left the family and, and uh, the guy had to raise the kids by himself. According to a 2020 Texas Monthly article on the Seals family, it was actually Danny's grandmother who told Danny about the Ira Ann Texas mother who abandoned her husband and children and inspired this beautiful song. Danny and the previously mentioned Bob McDill wrote the tune from the perspective of the father, a journeyman rodeo rider left to raise his daughter Casey all by himself. It was a very deeply moving piece of work for, for Dan's career and uh, meant a lot to a lot of people. The song pretty much speaks for itself. It was his third consecutive number one, rightly so. It features some of Danny's most inspired writing, and it may well represent his finest vocal performance. But oh, sometimes I think about you And the way you used to ride up In your riding stones and your sequins The falsetto there in the chorus has been described as yodeling by some hearkening right back to the days of Jimmy Rogers. Just one of the elements that makes this tune, in the rich history of country music rodeo songs, one of the very finest. It may well be that the previous two singles, Meet Me in Montana and Bop, actually outperformed Everything That Glitters Is Not Gold, sold more copies, made it to more ears, gave Danny more exposure. But there is no question in my mind that Dan Seals, the singer, the songwriter, the force in popular music for 25 years, will be far better remembered for that one right there. Everything that glitters is not gold. Oh, everything glitters is not gold. Tony Gottlieb recalls the song's role in a prestigious appearance at the 1987 Houston Rodeo and Livestock Show. The Houston Astrodome is a parabola, and to play in that place, this was pre-ear monitors. You know, you know, nowadays it's nothing, but then to to be able to sing live in a in a parabola like that was an incredible difficulty, and it went very very well, and then. He, we decided to close the show with everything that glitters is not gold. And it was a great, great moment for him with the crowd. You know, 50,000 people standing was surely the, the proudest moment. Dan Seals plowed through the rest of the 80s with an aggressive string of number one singles. To name only a few, 1987's You Still Move Me, You Still Move Me, Though I'd never let her know, There's a place inside of me that just. From that same year, Three Time Loser. You see, first time love, I was too young to 
second time I was left holding on. Third time's charm, but I got burned. Three time loser will never learn. Another classic co-write with Bob McDill, Big Wheels in the Moonlight in 1988. And I won't put my life on the center line. And I won't see the world before I die. The catchy throwback rock and roller, Love on Arrival. I've been lonely, I've been blue. And of course, the 1990 cover of Good Times by Sam Cooke. Get in the groove and let the good times roll. I'm gonna stay here till I soothe my soul. If it takes all night long, yeah. Everybody let the good times roll. In the early 90s, my country music audience might have encountered a 1 800 country advertisement on TV. But from 1-800-COUNTRY, Dan Seals. And the way you used to ride up. A timeless collection of Dan Seals classics. An exceptional value. To get yours, just dial 1-800-COUNTRY. Oh, okay, well, that was sort of my brainchild in a way. By 1990, Dan Seals had registered 11 number one country singles. But there was a slight issue. We felt possibly that we had a identity problem because a lot of people would come up and say, I didn't know you did that song and that mm. song and that song. We couldn't seem to rise above that. His songs were all over the radio. He was getting plenty of airplay, but nobody would put those songs together with the, with the guy who had written and sung most of them. Tony Gottlieb came up with perhaps an unconventional plan for alleviating Danny's identity problem. In those days, I would see these KTEL commercials and these uh, TV albums. Get KTEL's best of country music, 24 great hits, only $4.99, 8 track tape, $5.99. But I came up with this idea that, you know, if we could just do some commercials with Dan, where he was singing these songs that that would really help his career. In other words, Tony wanted to advertise to the home TV watchers that Dan Seals was the one who sang all these songs. The idea evolved into crafting a set of music videos, Danny singing his biggest songs. I figured, well, let's do a portrait video to where they can see all the songs and some of the things that I love and where I came from and get a chance to know me. And so we, we took a, a 20-piece crew from Los Angeles and went out to Kingman, Arizona for a month and shot this thing. We, we appropriated the budget to do what we called the portrait, which was about a 28 minute long form video that uh, had uh, some interview footage with Dan, also had a, uh, a video on God Must Be a Cowboy, uh, Everything That Glitters Is Not Gold, and Big Wheels in the Moonlight. And out, out of that, we uh, sourced the footage for the 1-800-Country television commercials. And the reason I liked 1-800-Country is because it was an easy mnemonic. It was easy to remember. For a time, these ads were all over country music television. I started buying huge amounts of time, commercial time, on country music television. And my goodness... It was astonishing what happened. All the problems I had of face name recognition for Dan Seals almost overnight went away. Unfortunately, so did Danny's chart success. After the Sam Cooke cover Good Times hit number one in 1990, Danny put out the masterful song Border Town as his next single. Despite being another one of my favorites, that one would only peak at 49. With the country music landscape dramatically changing in the 90s, Dan Seals' hit-making days were suddenly over. 
Danny would go on to record several more studio albums, including two acoustic albums in which he revisited the biggest hits from his entire career. I'm not talking about moving in, and I don't want to change your life. Then, in the early aughts, Danny's musical career would come full circle as he and his brother Jim lobbied Tony Gottlieb to play and tour together professionally. It had come in the heels of me asking to possibly put together uh, Seals and Crofts in England and John Farcoli again, and which they weren't particularly wild about. So they walked in the office one day and they said, what do you think about the two of us going out? And it was like, well, okay, that would be interesting. The brother duo would tour as Seals and Seals. It was a marketing nightmare. <laughs> but it was never more fun. You know, playing those shows was probably the best time of Dan's career and Jim. And they just had a fabulous time because, you know, they, they sort of came in as unknowns and people were throwing babies up in the air by the end of the show. They figured out who these guys were. You know? That had to be some set they put together. Perhaps appropriately, but no less tragically, Seals and Seals would also be Danny's swan song. One day, Dan, you know, who was always prone to uh, sore throats, came in back from the doctor, and he had a picture with him of the uh, lesion that was in his throat. The diagnosis, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You know, at first, I thought, you know that this wasn't going to be a big deal, you know, because Dan was in pretty good health. You know, he'd always taken pretty good care of himself. You know, everybody was hanging on, thinking Dan was going to get better. Eventually, treatment for Dan came down to a stem cell transplant, which didn't go well. The donor match was imperfect, and he suffered graft versus host uh, reaction very, very negatively. On uh, March 25th, 2009, uh, was a really sad day for everyone. And he came home and passed away uh, at his daughter's house here in Nashville. And uh, it was the end of a, you know, a really deep and time-honored friendship between the two of us. You know, we'd spent the best part of our lives together. Danny Wayland Seals was 61 years old when he passed away in 2009. Far too few knew about it. There are other popular musicians like Danny. Folks who, similarly, achieved major success as part of different acts and multiple genres over many, many years. Kenny Rogers comes to mind. Linda Ronstadt, for sure. Heck, even Darius Rucker more recently. The difference is that their transitions are well-acknowledged highlights on their resumes. It's a feather in Darius's cap that he was once hooty. Dan Seals, on the other hand, is well known as two different artists by different segments of the listening public. And indeed, his records still elicit is that the guy from Seals and Crofts questions when carried around in a record store. Confirmed by yours truly. But the difference between Danny and the others also runs deeper. With no disrespect to the others, Danny's talent was uniquely broad. It's genuinely hard to say whether he was a better writer than he was a performer. With most other artists that have reached that level of success, it's usually pretty clear. Anyway, if there's one thing I set out to do here with this one, it was to excavate a well-known but often overlooked body of work and deliberately credit all of it to the one and only Dan Seals. For those previously unfamiliar, hopefully I've stoked some interest in his music. And if you already were a Dan Seals fan, I hope this was a worthy tribute. Perhaps you'll let me know. Seriously special thanks to manager Tony Gottlieb. I called him requesting no more than a one-hour interview, and he gave me nearly two hours filled with great stories and obscure information. Tony wanted me to leave y'all with this. 
I'm at the end of my career and I would just urge young performers to look for deep meaning in their work and to try to maintain some pride and integrity. You know, sometimes when everything is associated with how you look, the songs get second. And I know that that wasn't what Dan Seals would do. He, you know, he thought looking good was important, but if the song wasn't happening, it wasn't going down. And he didn't care how much money was involved. Thanks, Tony, and thanks, audience. I'm Jack Shaw. This is the Neon Neighbors Podcast. (laughs) 